My name is Jonah Jonathan and welcome once again to the Jazz Musician's Voice. Tonight we have the rare opportunity into the life of a true jazz bass legend, Dr. Larry Ridley. Dr. Ridley has an extensive performance resume and has worked with the likes of Thelonious Monk, Duke Ellington, Sonny Rollins, Art Blakey, Roy Haynes, and many others. Dr. Ridley has his Bachelor's of science from Indiana University and his bachelor's of music education from New York University and he has a master's in political science from the Empire State um, in New York and he has his doctorate from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore and he founded the jazz program at Rutgers University among many of the things that he's done and he's also the executive director of the African American Jazz Caucus and in addition to winning numerous awards, uh, Dr. Ridley has recently been teaching uh, some really great classes at Swing University at Jazz and Lincoln Center. During our interview, we talk about Dr. Ridley's roots in Indiana, as well as his time in New York and some of the many great musicians he's worked with, as well as his educational background. The interview is a one hour long interview, a little bit over an hour. and. Uh, I think it's really uh, informative and I think you guys will learn something from such a great legend on the scene. Dr. Ridley was born in 1937 and really somebody who can instill knowledge in some of us younger musicians and, and audience that's watching these videos. So I hope you guys enjoy watching. Please stay tuned. Some more videos are going to be coming out very soon. And uh, subscribe to these videos and uh, just continue watching. And what I'll also do is post small snippets of this interview um, that are highlights of the interview so you guys can check out these small parts of the interview if you don't have time to watch the whole interview or if you prefer to watch the whole interview, enjoy. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, tonight I have the wonderful opportunity to interview jazz bass legend Dr. Larry Ridley. Professor Emeritus at Rutgers University and the Executive Director of African American Jazz Caucus. Dr. Ridley, for people who aren't familiar with your background, could you tell us initially how you got started playing music and eventually jazz? Well, I started playing music early on when uh, I was just a kid. I was a radio baby because I was born in 1937 and um, radio was the thing. And um, I used to hear all kinds of music on, on the radio and uh, there was the Bell Telephone Hour, which was a, a very well listened to and supported uh, show that was on the radio. And I was hearing mostly violin players like uh, Yasha Heifetz and, and uh, others, leading, uh, Fritz Chrysler and people like this. And um, I was always telling my mother, <clears throat> excuse me, clear my throat here. I was always telling my mother that I wanted to play music. And I had an uncle, Ben Holloman, who was one of the uh, gentlemen who uh, uh, played in a lot of the bands. And he was very close with U.B. Blake and Noble Sissel, people like that. And so he was originally from Texas and he moved to Indiana, to Indianapolis. And when I was a kid, I started playing the violin and uh, in fact, there's a, a recording that I have somewhere that it was on one of those webcore 
recorders that had the little paper disc. Wow. And it's he and I playing. He played to get. He was playing the guitar. He was also a saxophonist. And uh, I'm playing boogie woogie on the violin. Mm -hmm. And I always, you know, and I ended up studying. And I went to. There was a woman by the name of Ruth MacArthur, uh, African American woman who was the one that introduced music in the public schools in the black sc schools there in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, she had a conservatory that she started that was right in the heart of what was the, the main stem of the African-American community on Indiana Avenue in that, that area. And uh, she had some of the really top people that uh, were on the faculty that are offering lessons. And that's how I started. I started with her. And she worked out a, an arrangement with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, uh, who at that time was uh, conducted by Fabian Savitsky, uh, who had shortened his name because he was uh, uh, a relative of Serge Kusevitsky. But uh, in order to avoid I, I, the story I got, you know, I never got it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. But uh, it, in order not to have the conflict between Kusevitsky and Savitsky, so that you know he would be recognized for his contribution and what he was about. Very, very interesting gentleman. I got a chance to meet him when I was very young, you know. And so she worked. Miss MacArthur worked out an arrangement with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra to have some of the players in the orchestra to teach at her conservatory. And the first violinist, uh, first chair violinist was a woman by the name of Mildred Lind, L-I-N-D. And uh, I lost track of her for a number of years, but then I found out that she was just re not too long ago that she was down and had spent uh, the last part of her years down in Florida. Oh, wow. Yeah, after she retired from the, the orchestra. And I kind of lost contact because I was doing my thing and growing up and whatever. And then I was thinking about her and I said, oh, I wonder if she's still around, you know. And then I did Google and I did a whole lot of tracing and I found out that she uh, had uh, been living in Florida and she passed. Unfortunately, just not to, it, it, you know, when I started doing the research trying to find her, I found out that she was, uh, she had only passed away about maybe a year or two before I started making my inquiry. And I'm sorry, I, I didn't uh, have an opportunity to touch base with her to let her know how I had progressed. How you progressed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. But then I always wanted to play jazz because I was hearing that and, every, you know, my family, I was hearing Duke Ellington, Count Basie, and then I lived in the Lockfield Gardens apartments, which was like the second uh, project for African Americans that was built in, in the Roosevelt administration, Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, uh, we ended up with an apartment there, and uh, that's where I grew up around a, a lot of guys. Virgil Jones, a great trumpet player from Indianapolis. And, we, you know, we used to all hang out, uh, Slide Hampton and his family, and there's a number of musicians from Indianapolis, David Baker. And you worked with uh, Freddie. Over and and Freddie Hubbard, and you know, we met when we James were... James Spaulding, right? Both yeah. Those guys. And yeah. James Spaulding li also lived in these projects, too, in his family. So, you know, we were all, there was a whole bunch of people I could name, you know, but uh, people can read about that some other time, you know, sure, yeah. rather than taking up the time to try to identify everybody. But it was a very rich community uh, with a lot of great musicians. And I came up around the Montgomery Brothers and, uh, you know, J.J. Johnson was uh, from there. In fact, I, I played a lot with Wes Montgomery. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Monk, Monk Montgomery, uh, I saw him on the street. And I wanted to take a lesson, so I approached him, and he uh, he said, "Yeah, come on by." And he gave me his phone number and his address and everything. So I went over, and I ring the bell, and I go in, and uh, I see the group is set up. They had a group called the Montgomery Johnson Quintet. They were playing at a white club that was out near the Indianapolis Speedway, and uh, it was a, a club that really didn't cater to black people, but they had the music in there and they had the gig in there, the Montgomery Johnson Quintet. 
And so I'd look up and there's Buddy Montgomery on the piano, Wes is on the guitar, and Sonny Johnson was the drummer, and Pookie Johnson, Alonzo Pookie Johnson was this tenor saxophonist. So they played it a couple of numbers, you know, and I'm listening, watching the rehearsal and listening. And so the next thing I know, Monk lays the bass down and he calls me, he said, hey kid, come on over here, you know, and pick up the bass. So I'm saying, wait, what? Pick up the bass, you know, what's happening? You know, because I'm in awe sitting there with these, <laughs> these great musicians, you know, and I'm just a teenager, like, you know, 15, 16 years old. So I pick up the bass and I was behind because I taught myself first how to play the bass because I just transferred knowing the treble clef and all that and you know. Um, yeah, you started on violin. So I started on the violin. I just transferred what I knew from learning the violin over and started playing the bass and I was listening to it all the time. And uh, I went to the jazz at the Philharmonic and uh, they came through town and performed it. It was, it was one of the stops on the tour of the jazz, of Norman Grant's Jazz of the Philharmonic. And I heard Ray Brown playing with uh, Oscar Peterson and Herb Ellis, who was the guitarist. And they were back in uh, uh, Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah, legendary. <laughs> oh man, they were stomping down, let me tell you. And I said, oh wow, and I was just mesmerized by Ray, you know, he was just, he was just so beautiful. So it was then that, you know, that was before I met Monk, mm -hmm. but uh, that's, um, that's what really started me. The defining moment. Yeah. yeah, that was the defining moment. And a friend of mine that lived around the corner from me worked at a pawn shop and they had a K bass there. No, it was a King bass. King bass. King bass, right. yeah. yeah. And so, um, is either K, I had a K and also a King, but I'm not sure which, right now, I'm not remembering which was first. Great plywood basses. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, that's how I started playing, you know, and he got, he got this bass for me. And uh, I started playing and uh, listening to records and things like that. And then when I met Monk, then I ended up, Monk told me that he was getting ready to go to Seattle and down to California, because he was starting this new group called the Master Sounds, which was a takeoff on the modern jazz quartet. Mm -hmm. Said by then, uh, Monk had started playing the Fender bass guitar when he was with uh, Lionel Hampton. So anyway, he says, well, I want you to take my place while I'm going out there. I'm saying, what? <laughs> this is a dream. <laughs> dream oh, country. man. And so I picked up and I started playing and Wes was sitting up and, you know, Wes was always smiling, you know, he was... Just such a beautiful guy he around to me, and he was listening to me, and he said, yeah, okay. And it was very encouraging, man, and, and all those guys, they just took me under their wing. I was like their little brother, you know. And I learned so much from them, and then Freddie Hubbard and, and I started doing things together, and Jimmy Spaulding. And so I started the group uh, that was called the Jazz Contemporaries. There's, it's erroneously listed that it was Freddie's group. It was not his group, it was my group. group. Yeah. I was the one that formulated it. But we used to hang out and his brother, Ermin Jr., was the one that played bebop style piano. He was into Bud Powell. And he's the one that introduced me to Oscar Pettiford, Johnny Minkus. Yeah, uh, the, and the uh, cats. <laughs> yeah. Cats players. And um, so my two of my uncles, uh, my father's brothers, uh, Thomas Ridley and Martin Ridley, they knew the owner and the manager of this place called George's Bar, which was on the main stem, Indiana Avenue. So I had approached them about getting us a gig. And that's how we got the gig at George's Bar. And we stayed there for, oh man, two or three months wow, we were there. Yeah. And uh, we were only 16, 17 years old. Working, working almost every night, right? <laughs> we played six nights a week. And we did two matinees a that's, week. Uh, and incredible. all the fine young ladies used to show up. And that, that made all the cats come yeah, in, you know. Sweet, sweet so <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful, man. It was a great experience. And in fact, there's a, 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 a tape that some guys, two students from Indiana University down in Bloomington, they came up and they had one of those webcore wire recorders. And they recorded it. Wow. 
And so there's, there's an existing, I have a, a copy of the recording that these guys did. They, they gave, gave me a copy. Uh, and David Baker was there. So, you know, David Baker's been like a big brother to me. Yeah, a mentor to you. Yeah. He was at Indiana State as well, right? He, well, he, he, he went to Indiana and he was a student first. And then uh, when I graduated from high school in 1955, uh, I went down there, and uh, Dr. Roscoe Poland, who was the president of the National Association of Negro Musicians, he was very well connected, and he was more in the classical area. He was able to get me a scholarship in my freshman year at that Indiana University, and that's how I arrived. At. Yeah, that was a violin scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. So I played the Mozart Concerto in D major. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was my audition piece, but I was still had been playing, had yeah, been, on the been side playing, of that. yeah. But I wanted to go to school because I always had it in my mind. And, you know, talking with my mom, because my mom used to come with me. She was fantastic. And my dad, both, both of them. I was very fortunate to have two beautiful parents, you know, and a family that was very supportive. So that's how I ended up there and uh, playing gigs and stuff, because that was before they had a jazz program and they didn't really like us yeah, playing how, jazz. How was, it, how was it in school, in the music program? Back, back in those days? Uh, well, it, it was strictly European strictly classical, classical. European classical music, you know. And I played in the orchestra, the Indiana University uh, Philharmonic Orchestra. And I also played in a string quartet. I even played viola in a string quartet. I, I assume you must have gotten some uh, benefit from getting that uh, impeccable classical technique. Well, yeah, it was it was something that I enjoyed, and uh, you know, and it did help me because it introduced me to other forms of music, and uh, like I say, hearing uh, Yasha Heifetz on the Bell Telephone Hour, that's what really inspired me when I was a little kid. Because every every other day, I was telling my mother, "Well, I want to play the trumpet. I want to play the drums." This and my mother said, "Wait a minute, you got to make up your mind." So we had a, a a cousin who was working at a music store there in Indianapolis. And when I first started playing, and I had this little tiny violin that he was able to get for me. And that's what I started on when I was just five years old. And my mother used to go to the music lessons with me, with Miss MacArthur, and she'd remember everything that went on in the lesson. And she had this uh, vanity table with the, the mirrors, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, with the obvious, uh, ovular uh, bench and the guys would be knocking on it come on Larry come on out and play you know and my mother said not until you do everything that Miss MacArthur was showing you to practice before your next lesson well I wish I had <laughs> that, that, uh, that discipline and I'm so happy that she did that you know and my mother was just very supportive of me and then later my brothers I was the oldest and then my uh, brother next to me, Michael, he ended up being a trumpet player. And uh, my sister, Lynn, she sort of messed around with the piano a little bit. She never really, her big, uh, was the Beethoven Moonlight Sonata. That was her, that was her piece. You know, she'd yeah, be up yeah. on the upright piano that we had in the house, you know. Uh, so she never really progressed beyond uh, a very neophyte version of you know, and that was her thing. But anyway, you know, like I'm sort of jumping around a little bit. Sure, but, yeah. All right. So, you, but uh, it was that kind of rich, fertile background. You got a lot. You got a lot over there. Um, when when did you decide to make the move to New York? When did that happen? Well, when I was at Indiana University. Um, David Baker had a big band, and I was playing with the big band, and there was a trumpet player by the name of Alan Kiger, who was there also, a good trumpet player. And uh, we all worked together in David's big band and even small groups. David was playing trombone at that time. And uh, Gunther Schuller came through with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and they did a performance there at Indiana University in the concert hall. And we got a chance to meet him because we knew he was doing stuff with jazz, with, you know, the, the third stream stuff, third and he was tied yeah. up with John Lewis and uh, all the people that were part of that camp. Uh, 
uh, Bill Russo, uh, George Russell, you know, so that uh, it was, and then he gave us scholarships to come to the Linux School of Jazz. And I got yeah, a chance to, to yeah. hang out and uh, study with uh, Percy Heath and Milt Jackson and all the guys with Connie Kay and John Lewis. And I played in a band uh, uh, that was uh, conducted by John Lewis and Max Roach. And uh, Arnett Coleman was in the band, Don Cherry. Uh, Barry Greenspan was the, the drummer. Steve Kuhn was the pianist. And, um, oh God, the, the trombonist player, oh, his name is escaping me right now. It's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't call it right now. But anyway, we, we were, that was the group we played in. Yeah. In fact, there's a recording of this. Is a, an amazing uh, place I've heard from, I actually, I've heard from Mr. Carter, Ron Carter, he also told me about the Lennox School of Jazz. And um, uh, I'm from uh, Western Massachusetts, so, uh, I'm familiar with that area. Now they have the Tanglewood uh, Institute over there, but uh, I've heard from many about that Lang School of Jazz, and uh, uh, I think Ray Brown was a teacher there as well, right? At some point, I think. Ray, he wasn't there when when I was there. I was there. The we we were there the second year. The of second it. year started. Yeah, because it started '58. Oh, okay. And yeah. then. Um, we came in 59. And it was great because I met Marshall Stearns and, and we had classes with him about the story of jazz, you know, with his book and everything. And also Dr. Willis James. And uh, Phil Schapp was mentioning earlier, you know, about uh, John W. Work, who's chronicled a lot of the yeah. Negro uh, spirituals and the various uh, pieces. Well, they were contemporaries working at uh, Fisk University. And uh, I got a chance to really get into understanding more in depth some of the more indigenous music from from the African American community, yeah, you know, which background. was fantastic, you know, and uh, and that's one of the things that put me on the quest that I've been on for several years now, in understanding that, and that's how Phil Schaap and I even came to know each other, and through his doing the bird flight, and his dad was a, a good. Uh, was a nice man, beautiful man, and yeah. uh, so Phil and I have been, you know, like brothers, you know. Uh, I back he, he calls me his, his bigger brother, you know, but I'm saying now he's standing, what, six, six <laughs> five or something like that, here I am, 5'11", you know. <laughs> but it was really, it was a fantastic experience, and that's when I first went into New York. And by then, Freddie Hubbard had gone up in 1958. He had gone to, to New York, and he was living there. So I went and I hung out with, with Freddie. And then I had to come back to Indianapolis. But then in 1960, I was playing at a club in, in Indianapolis called the 16th Street Tavern. It was on right on uh, near the corner of 16th Street and Northwestern Avenue, which is now Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. uh, drive, yeah. and um, I was playing in the house band six nights a week wow. with a matinee, yeah. and with a great drummer. It was his band, uh, Fo Earl Fox Walker. He had been a, a drummer with uh, Lionel Hampton's band, and uh, and Charlie Mingus was a member of Lionel Hampton's band during yeah. that time. Yeah. Uh, so Freddie and Slide came through, and. Um, they sat in on the matinee, and so Sly liked what I was doing, you know, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, Larry, you sound like a young Paul Chambers, you know, how would you like to join my band? I said, Psh, hey, is fat me greasy? You know, just send for me and I'll come, and I met the, met the it was a Slide Hampton Octet, and I met them in Pittsburgh, we played at the Crawford's Grill up on the hill, you know, in, in Pittsburgh, which is a really uh, well-known club. There were several clubs there in, mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh. You know, and that's where Ray Brown and a whole bunch of guys, yeah, you know. Paul Chambers was born there in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And a lot of great, Bobby Boswell, another great bass player that played with Max for a number of years. And uh, you were uh, Joe the Harris, right time. <laughs> Joe <laughs> Harris, the drummer, who played with Dizzy's big band. 
a lot of great musicians came out of out of uh, out of there, and some of the younger guys now that ended up being one of my students is Steve Nelson, the vibe. Oh yes, yeah, Steve Vibram Nelson. Function. Yeah, Steve yeah, was he was, he was a, Yeah. And uh, yo, J C Moses, great drummer. He was from there. Yeah, you came to New York uh, at a time that's just an uh, amazing time. I guess you came as you know your contemporaries on the bass also arrived around this time. Uh, Ron Carter and and Bill Lee, and uh, on the piano I know Harold Mayburn arrived at that time. It just a it must have been a, an incredible time in New York. Um, can you tell us some? Uh, some of your first impressions getting to New York at that time, like oh, I loved it because I when I first come that first time I told you and I came and I met I hung out with Freddie, mm -hmm. and you know uh, we stayed at Sly's apartment. Uh, he lived on 126th Street behind, right behind the Apollo Theater, and wow. uh, I slept on this old army cot. But I mean, it felt like a ceiling because. I was happy to be in New York, yeah. man, and got a chance to go around <laughs> and hear all these yeah. great musicians, and oh man, it was it was beautiful, and you know, and then moving there, and um, it was it was a fantastic experience. Yeah, to, I mean, to be there, you were and, there at the, the right time. I mean, you recorded, uh, some and I came there with a gig. Yeah. I came there with a gig, because immediately we worked at different clubs in in New York, you know. Oh, and uh, so I got a chance to, to do a lot, and then that's where I met Philly Joe. Philly Joe Jones took me under his wing, and Paul Chambers and I used to hang out all the time. I was really a lot tighter with, with Paul. Uh, Ron came in. He was going to school upstate New York. Um, uh, Eastman, yeah. Eastman, yeah. yeah. He was there, and he came in. About the same time, and Ron and I, you know, we're, we're like that too. Yeah, you guys are only a few months apart in age, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, at that time, I mean. But there were a lot of great bass players. Chris, yeah, you came uh, at the time. Chris White, uh, Bill Lee. I, Bill Lee used to turn me on a lot of gigs because he used to work a lot of the, with the folk singers and stuff like that. That's how I ended up with Josh White. And uh, I also, at, at Lennox, I got a chance to play with Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry. There was another bass player I met that year that we were at Lennox. He was playing with uh, piano player Dick Katz. His name was Tommy Williams from Brooklyn. Heavy cat. <laughs> Woo! He could bow his butt off, and man, I mean, he could play, man. He was, Tommy was just fantastic. And it was very interesting. He played with uh, JJ for a yeah, while, yeah. too, you know. But he, he, he got out of the music business, and he ended up working at Sam Ash Music Store oh, wow. in, in Brooklyn. Yeah. I never could figure that out, and I used to try to gently ask him what what prompted him to uh, stop playing because he was such a great player, man. I mean, he could bow his. You know, another guy that a lot of people are not aware of, uh, they're not like household names, was Eddie Mathias from Philadelphia. Eddie me, Ken. me. <laughs> yeah, he could yeah. bow too, man, and he'd play, uh -huh. man. But there were a lot of cats, you know, that were around there, spanky the breast, and. And yeah, I mean, I'll read I'll read uh, some of these uh, these names of people we've worked with, especially in the '60s. I mean, I mean, you're on some of the most important albums of the '60s. I mean, you you worked and recorded with such legends as Horace Silver, Lee Morgan, Dexter Gordon, Red Garland, Jackie McLean, Roy Haynes, and Hank Mobley. Uh, not to mention working with Duke Ellington. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about? Working with some of these guys, I mean, at that time it must have been uh, for well, us younger in, guys. That's incredible. And well, and I was in seventh heaven to tell you the <laughs> truth, because these were all these were all my idols. You know, people that I knew and loved from their recordings, and and we used to go up to Chicago a lot, Freddie and all of us, and Spalding. We used to go up and to catch the groups up there. And Spalding ended up moving to Chicago for a while, you know, and uh, but. Uh, I had met, that's where I met Ahmed Jamal, and I sat up under Israel Crosby, you know. Yeah. It was fantastic, <laughs> man. Oh, Israel Crosby, man. When I worked years later with uh, Benny Goodman, I asked him about Israel, and he told me he had some nice things to say about Israel. He was talking about 
Israel had a, a way of having like sort of a sixth sense. He knew where you were going with whatever your line. So when Benny said he'd be playing the clarinet, Israel was just a, a great support, and, and his contrapuntal lines were just so fantastic. He loved Israel. You know. Mm -hmm. Then I also met Milt Hinton, mm -hmm. came here, and, and Richard Davis, and yeah. Doug Watkins. Oh man, there's so many cats, man. All amazing cats. Yeah, yeah, man, it was it was it was it was really really a, a great time, and um, so many guys, man. That were, that yeah, I have a couple of favorite albums. You know, I, I really enjoy um, Cornbread with Lee Morgan. You were on that album, yeah, uh, which produced one of the standards, Ciara. Yeah. Um, do you have memories from that session? Any anything you remember from that? I remember I enjoyed it very much, and, and we had a ball. It was, they, we used to uh, Blue Note used to have like a couple of rehearsals before we would do the I could go out to Rudy Van Gelder's mm -hmm. studio to record, and uh, I remember everything went down smoothly in the in the rehearsals, and by the time we got out there, we didn't do a whole lot of takes. Just bend it because out. we. <laughs> You know, and the level of musicianship was such that it didn't really take a lot, and everybody was sort of in tune with each other, so we didn't need to, it wasn't where you were stopping and starting, you know, like a symphony orchestra going, oh, go back to bar 22, yeah, this, that, and the other, whatever. Just, you know, no, you know, <laughs> and uh, it was just a pleasure to be in the studio with mm -hmm. those guys, and that's when Herbie Hancock, uh, you know, was just a really beautiful, Beautiful player. And, and how did uh, Van Gilder, as a bass player, how did Van Gilder work out to record your bass? What what kind of recording did you use on your bass at that point in time? We just had a microphone, and, you, you know, in front of the in the front, front of the with bass. like a little cloth or something. Yeah, sometimes in a towel or something like that. Stick it up maybe up in the bridge. That was one one technique. But he had a, a mic, mic, and, and Rudy was always very fussy about his equipment. Because I remember one time I went to adjust something and really came out of the room and he used to wear these brown uh, <laughs> cotton gloves, you know. And he's, oh, Larry, no, no, don't, don't touch him, don't touch him. You, <laughs> I said, okay, Rudy, I'm, okay. Well, the, you can tell the, the sound, those records. Rudy's a genius, about. man. He's a genius recording engineer. I can't say enough about, about uh, uh, Rudy Van Gelder, man. And, he and I got along very well, you know. All the time I would, times I would record out there, uh, we yes, had a nice right. rapport, you know. But he didn't like guys messing with the, the mics and all that stuff, you know. He was very touchy about that, and I mean, which was understandable, you know, yeah. because you know guys be half drunk or whatever, you know, <laughs> messing with this stuff. He didn't want. He had a lot of money sunk in it. Was a really yeah. nice studio. Yeah, it's. A, I, mean, I didn't. I didn't record. Nice when he was doing stuff in his living room, some of those early prestige recordings and stuff were done there. But then when he, when I was doing stuff with him, that's when he had the, his the uh, spot studio. And it, yeah. yeah. And uh, the, another album I really dig is um, the Jody Grind with Horace. Oh, with Horace? That, that you were on. Um, how was it to work with Horace? Beautiful. Horace, we had, we had uniforms. We, uh, there was a place in Brooklyn that uh, sold, uh, you know, sport coats and stuff like that. Yeah, and, yeah. and Horace had us with the uniform. We had uh, two jackets. One was a, a brown jacket and one, I forget the color of the other one. Maybe that seemed like it was red or something like that. And then we had uh, our pants, but we were very uniform and, you know, we were sharp. <laughs> and Horace was pants. a businessman. <laughs> And just a great player, man. Horse could sweat, man, but he'd be pumping it out, boy. He'd be over there. <laughs> yeah. And his hair would be flopping all over the place. But, but uh, that was a, a pleasurable experience, you know. And uh, uh, when I joined the band, uh, I took Teddy Smith's place. Um, uh, and um, it was, um, of course, Horace on piano. Roger Humphreys, who's also out of Pittsburgh, great drummer. Yeah. Uh, 
he was the drummer, and uh, Woody, was Woody Shaw, Shaw yeah. and uh, Joe Henderson first, and then uh, when Joe left the band, uh, Tyrone Washington came in. And, All heavy cats. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then Tyrone was Woody's cut buddy from Newark, you know, they grew up together in Newark. And uh, he just came and fit right in, you know. But uh, Horace always believed in doing the music while we were going and traveling around. If we played in Atlanta or Pittsburgh or Chicago or wherever we went, we were playing the music. So by the time, because Horace didn't like the idea of having multiple takes in the studio. He didn't want to give them a lot of extra things. And I think he probably got, got some of that from the way uh, Herman Lubinsky used to do <laughs> at Savoy Records where he had all these outtakes of Charlie Parker where there's somebody make a mistake and, keep and they'd stop <laughs> and then they'd take another tape. Uh, but Horace didn't like to, to have them have takes in the can. So we were well rehearsed, so we went in, it was just like playing the gig. Yeah, now, nowadays uh, studios are a much different place. I mean, people are people are recording songs over and over again and crazy stuff. But you know, the but you lose did, some of the they, spontaneity they when it's it, yeah. when it's it's too rehearsed or you stopping and starting and stuff like that. You know, it's it's best to, to rehearse on the outside and get the basic nitty gritty together. And then when you go into studio, it's business. <laughs> it's a piece of cake, you know. Yeah. And, uh, Other than what will happen, will happen, you know. Yeah, Stuff just, happens, somebody might hit microphone by mistake, you know, bump it, the trumpet bell and the, or something that will stop the take or, you know, but other than that, it was straight ahead, you know. Uh, one, one other person from the 60s or your time working with him, uh, I wanted to ask you about um, working with Duke Ellington. Because uh, I, I mean, that's just, he's... If you think of jazz, no, no further to think than Duke Ellington. <laughs> well, with Duke Ellington, the thing that was, I ended up uh, playing with the band because Joe Benjamin, great bass player, had been playing with him, and they were playing at he was playing at the Rainbow Grill, and it was first it was an abbreviated version of of the band at the Rainbow Grill, Johnny Hodges all. Harry Carney, and I had known, uh, uh, Harry Carney knew my family because he used to date one of my aunts. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, uh, the, the daughter of the uncle I was telling you that played the, the guitar That's and the guitar, also yeah. played saxophone, my uncle Ben Holloman. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Harry was sweet on her. <laughs> uh, and uh, playing with that band, I mean, one of the things that immediately that I, I, I enjoyed, we, we would start out playing without Duke, and Duke would come out and make his entrance, you know. Yeah. And it was very interesting because the band, when we were playing without him, the band still was tight and was hitting. But the minute, I'll never forget, it was, it was like one of those kind of, aha moments or something like that, you know, where you just see all of a sudden something happens and it's like the colors in the room change and stuff like that. When Duke came to the piano and he hit the chords down there, it was like all of a sudden each and every one of us became an extension of his fingers at the keyboard. Now that's my, that was my experience and that was real that's to amazing. me. Yeah. And that's what I felt. And uh, it was like, a, almost like a surreal experience. But then, I mean, then, and that proved to me the magic of Edward Kennedy Ellington. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it was, the band was cooking, like I said, but when he sat down and hit those chords and everything, we all became extension of his fingers. I'll never forget that feeling. It was, it was, a wonderful, wonderful experience. I'll never forget that in my life. That's great, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's kind of sent chills up me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he was, he was just so wonderful, and, and the way he would comp and the spacing. And the other part about it that was great was Harry Carney, sitting on the bottom of that saxophone section. 
and it was always a challenge, like, not a challenge, but it was great to just get, uh, really Work out hear my things. sound yeah. and to blend with him because he was sitting on it and he was such a heavy, I mean, his sound and every note that he played and to put the bass and just to focus on him with the rest of the band because, you know, Johnny Hodges, all them guys were bad dudes, you know. Yeah. But that was one of the things, like Harry playing the, the baritone, that I, I kind of locked into him right away and it just sort of set my groove off of him. And that kind of like just gave me the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, with Duke at the piano, man, it was, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I think uh, all these guys are really going to enjoy hearing some of these stories. Um, in the 70s, you became the bass player for arguably one of the most influential jazz musicians of all time, Thelonious Monk. Um, what was it like working with Thelonious? I mean, did you guys discuss music outside of playing? I mean, how was it to work with such a legend? I mean, like... Uh, Thelonious was a genius, <laughs> and the thing I always, one of the many things that I remember about Thelonious and that I loved about him was he was a master at understatement, you know, and if you listen to his solos, his use of time and space was incredible, and to lock in with him was, was you know, fantastic. Uh, and. We would rehearse, oh, we rehearsed over in uh, Weehawken at the, the Baroness's place. And uh, I, I and that big, <laughs> yeah, Nika's, and they, there was a big picture window there, and I realized how he came to write that song, Coming on the Hudson, because it was a beautiful view. You could see all the boats and everything going up to Hudson, because her place in Weehawken, and we'd be up upstairs there in, um, in the room, and Thelonious had a room in the back where he stayed. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was just so easy. It was so easy. Just playing with him and just locking in with him. And, and the, the, the groove, there again, that's one of the main things. That's the reason why when I'm teaching, I always try to get young guys to understand. You know, it's not if you play the medial Lydian idiot scales and all that kind of stuff. You got to learn tunes. You got to learn melodies, because you got to play, learn how to play melodic and and think contrapuntally in terms of the way you build your bass lines. And uh, it's important to know tunes. In in addition to learning your scales and sure. yeah. accessing your instrument, the fingerboard, and going into the different positions, blah blah blah. You know. But uh, playing with guys like Thelonious, you know, you, you immediately lock into their groove. And being a younger guy, you know, it was just so natural because these guys are so strong with their personality. Yeah. You know, and I had an opportunity to work with so many different drummers. I mean, Philly Joe took me under his wing. I was like his little brother. And I worked with his band. I played with Roy Haynes. I played with um, uh, Art Blakey, Max Roach. Because when I first came to New York, oh yeah, when I first came to New York, Max had always told me to ca call him. I kind of jump, started jumping ahead of myself, but I got to put this one on because Max had told me to call him when, when I got to New York. Mm -hmm. And I called him. And so he said, hey, how you doing? Come what are you doing? He said, I'm having a rehearsal, why don't you come on down, you know. We're going to rehearse uh, at, at the Village Gate. And I went down, and I got a chance to play the Freedom Now Suite. In fact, it was written up, and I didn't realize it, and I've been trying to hook up with her, but Maya Angelou, who I love, I love Miss, my sister, uh, Maya Angelou, and I never had a chance to really meet, but she was, she did a, 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 a narrative as a part of their Freedom Now Suite, Abby Lincoln, and <laughs> yeah. Eric Dolphy, um, Walter Benton, tenor player, and uh, uh, 
Marcus Belgrave, and Book a Little, I think it was there, yeah. It was, it was great. It was, it was great, man. Yeah. And the, I, I got, that was my first <laughs> gig when I, when other than, you know, a, apart from what I was doing with Slide Hampton, you know. But, uh, and Max just kind of took me under the wing. But I learned a lot from playing with all these different drummers, making the adjustment and learning how I had to place my notes and to, to get the feeling, because they all had a different kind of thing, you know, even the use of the cymbals, the way they tuned it. I remember one night at Birdland, we were playing, Philly Joe's band was playing opposite Art Blake and the Jazz Messengers, you know, and Philly Joe uh, accidentally hit a, hit a stick on the snare drum of his snare drum and it tore a big hole in it. So he ended up playing <laughs> the next set using um, Art's snare drum. Oh, wow. And the difference in the tone <laughs> that came from that was amazing, man. And it just showed the difference of, of the sound. That's what I heard, the, the sound of the way Philly Joe tuned his drums versus the way Art uh, tuned his snare drum, you know. And, and so understanding those kind of little nuances is, is so important, you know. And to have the opportunity to, to be with those masters like that, man. And, you know, and I play with so many great players, man. I mean, Cedar Walton, Tommy Flanagan, Hank Jones, Oh man, Jackie Bayard. Oh man, I can just go on and on. Horace Silver, you know. Takes a couple hours to name them all. <laughs> oh man, I've been I've been very fortunate. Good Lord, it's been good to be in that. I thank God, man. You know, yeah, and yeah. and I I thank my parents too, for giving me, and raising me with the type of character because I got, I got along with all those guys, you know. You know. That's and, important. Yeah, you know, and, and they all like me because I respected them. And, you know, you got to give respect in order to gain it. And you can't come in with with an attitude about anything. And I never even thought about having an attitude. You know, that, you know, that's too much respect. Mm -hmm. And I was raised to respect, you know. You know, I had a big family. My mother came from a family of 13 kids. And all of them were married, and I had first cousins. And we'd have we get together at my grandparents' house and be all the first cousin. We'd be all running around, and yeah. uh, you know it was just a good good feeling. And I've got relatives in Tennessee and Kentucky, all around in different different places. And when I meet people, you know, it's just like I meet you, your family. And you know, I, I don't have to put on any airs. You know, you mentioned about my credentials and this, that, and the other. Well, I thank you for mentioning all that, but I'm still just one guy who loves people. And I love people who are on the real side. Now, if you come to me with some phony baloney, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> yeah. run a little checkmate on you, you know. Yeah. I'll, give you a, I'll give you a minute to, to to take back your move and move somewhere else, you know. but. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, when you come forward, you come straight. Yeah. You know, because I don't, I don't, I don't uh, like nonsense because I'm, I'm a serious person. Sure. And I've l had a career where I, I realized the importance of education. That's why I went, got my degree even while I was still traveling all over the place and, and got involved in education. And I decided I wanted to go to Rutgers. And, and, yeah. I, and when I graduated from NYU, yeah. Yeah. the day I was getting ready to graduate, I talked to a friend of mine who owned a club called The Needle's Eye. Sue, Sue Yellen was her name, and her father and, uh, owned, owned the place. And she had this place called The Needle's Eye, and all the basketball players, Earl the Pearl, Monroe, and Willis Reed, all the basketball players would hang out there. And I used to do duo gigs, because she and I were close yeah. close uh, friends and uh, Harold Mayburn and I used to do stuff Ronnie Matthews he played piano uh, and we used to play there in, in, in the needle's eye and uh, there was a guy by the name of Bill White who was 
worked in the administration at Rutgers. And when I was getting ready to graduate, I said to Sue, I said, you know, I'm, I wonder if there's a place where I could, uh, I'd like to really get a college gig because I'd really like to pursue some of the things that, to remedy some of the situations I found at, at Indiana University at the time when I was there because they didn't really like you playing jazz and there was no jazz courses in the curriculum. And she told me, well, I, got, I have this friend, Bill White, that comes in the club all the time. I'll introduce you to him. And I talked to him, and we became very good friends. And he said, look, I, I, I'm going to speak to the people because they're starting uh, Livingston College. And uh, it's going to be because of all the riots that happened in Newark and different places, because they at first had planned on opening Livingston as uh, like a Bennington or Goddard College. Uh, you know, they, they were going to do it that way. But then they said, well, we better do something else because there was a cry for, you know, black studies, Puerto Rican studies, Asian studies, and all that kind of thing. So they brought in a lot of the young Turks, Nikki Giovanni, Tony K. Bambara, Nathan Hurd, uh, Lloyd McNeil, who was a flute player and also an artist. There were a lot of us that were there, uh, Dan Newman, Daniel Good, who here in New York does a lot of gigs sort of into the avant-garde uh, type of thing. That's not jazz, but uh, at the kitchen. And uh, so there, we had all these people that we were like sort of the, the uh, you know, at the avant-garde of the 60s, you know, during the 60s. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I went there for an interview and was hired the same day. Great, yeah. So, you know, a lot of good things have happened for me in my life, you know, that I was in the right place at the right time with the right stuff. Yeah, you founded the, uh, the jazz program there. Um, yeah. And you were there for nearly 30 years, right? You were there oh, yeah. For a very long time. Yeah. Uh, and then I brought in uh, Ted Dunbar, Kenny Barron, Frank Foster, Freddie Waits. Uh, and uh, Michael Carvin came in, and uh, uh, we just had a r really nice thing there. And we used to run a series. Of, I used to do a lot of concerts. In fact, I run into a lot of the students there that were there during that time, and they all packed the auditorium. And I got grants from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and the National Endowment for the Arts. And I used to bring in everybody, man. I brought in yeah. Milt Hinton, you name it, brought in. I've yeah. still got the flyers and everything. I'm going to put that together in a book at some point, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, document all this. I stuff. mean, it's amazing that uh, you were pretty much in the single-handedly found a jazz program. I mean, uh, it's probably one of the first jazz programs in the, in the country, if not the world. Um, well, that was hiring got actual practicing musicians. Yeah, that kind of thing. Because there were some guys that you know they the North Texas State, and then they had Berkeley. Uh, school of Music, mm -hmm. Alan Dawson was there. That's another great drummer that yeah, I had yeah. just to play and record with. Um, he's the one that developed the, 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 the drum program up at Berkeley School of Music. Mm -hmm. He was yeah. there from the beginning. And, um, but I was, I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time with the right stuff. And it was very, very profitable experience. That's great. I mean, um, and and uh, I mean, some of the questions that I've asked in the New York Jazz Musicians Voice, which is this series, um, re is regarding jazz education. Um, there are thoughts and concerns by many musicians that I've come across that um, jazz is perhaps the music of the streets and it shouldn't be taught in a collegiate setting. And um, someone at your high level who's was really founded a program, I, I wanted to know what you thought about that, whether you're not, you know, someone who's been on the streets and learned the music from the streets, do you I'm agree or streets. disagree with, <laughs> <laughs> with, with that sentiment? I mean, as someone who's founded Yeah, you can't take the street out of the board. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got along with all these musicians, because yeah. I was a street dude just like them, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I always... Uh, differed with that kind of thing. And to me, it was like a lot of elitist um, 
people that were involved in music who had jobs at institutions. And of course, you know, they were stressing mostly the European classical tradition. Sure. And that was, you know, because I had people through the years would come up to me and say, oh, you have such beautiful technique. You must have studied classical mu music. And I say, yeah, Percy Heath, Paul Chambers, Oscar <laughs> Pettiford. <Yeah. laughs> he said, no, no, you must have studied. I said, yeah, but you know, I did. I played the violin and I played the, you know, started playing the bass and went to school, uh, you know, on a scholarship and played that. But, you know, I didn't like that. I don't like that idea of trying to say one is greater. But then that was part of the, the snobbish elitism mm -hmm. that was a part of the way a lot of people thought with various music programs, you know, because, you know, they put on their Poison Ivy League jackets and get a pipe, you know, and yeah. act like, oh, I'm Dr. So and so. <laughs> yeah. So get out of here with that crap, you know. Mm -hmm. Because it definitely has a role. Because it's 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 a it's an art form that came, the roots are in Mother Africa, came through the African American experience, and it's, it's been, it's become global. And uh, all the great, we stand on the shoulders of many, that started all this, and that's one of the things that Phil Schapp always talks about in his classes, and that's we we compare notes, and he knows a lot, and he fills me in on a lot of a lot of things, you know and uh, vice versa, yeah, yeah. you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so the only thing that, I, the only problem, if, it's, if it is a problem, that I have with some of the institutions uh, starting jazz programs is that I think that sometimes they put the, some of the emphasis in the wrong, the wrong place. places. Because like I started off talking about the fact, you know, you know, they, they always want to take you through this thing you got to learn all, and you play all the, the uh, Samandal book, and you learn all that and all that. Okay, well, that was written by Samandal, taking some of the techniques that were happening in European classical music. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But jazz has its things, too. And one of the main elements is, like Duke Ellington said a long time ago, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's a part of it. And you got to learn melodies because all the great players, you hear them playing very melodically. Charlie Parker, you hear them occasionally make a quote. You know, all of them, from Louis Armstrong, you know, everybody, you know, it's that's all a part of jazz. Sure. And and the thing of being an instantaneous composer is what's very important. And uh, Do you think to get into that snobbish, <laughs> sort of, and then some of these programs, and then sometimes some of those programs become a little incestuous because they hire people who have never really been involved on a professional level playing with any major groups or performers. And I'm not knocking it, don't get me wrong, but I just think that sometimes uh, uh, it becomes a little antiseptic. You know, and you know if if you don't look at that emotional side and, and really look at the roots, and and that's all about it—the feeling and the spontaneity that comes from all of that. You know, and how important that is to the music. You know, there are people that play sort of what they call avant-garde or whatever, and they do all kinds of different things. But I'm locked into that. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Yeah, you know? yeah. Cause that's where I, I, that's what makes me feel good, and I like making people feel feel good. And uh, when you get it going, you know, it's you know, you see the people are getting happy, and they they enjoying yeah, yeah. it, and bopping to the music and dancing. Cause all the dancers always came around, you know, the swing dancers and the Lindy Hoppers and all those kind of people, and that was they. You know, it was a, a, a conversation that went on between those of us playing the musical instruments and them. And the dancers would be improvising and, yeah. doing, you know, guys would be tossing the lady over the head and, <laughs> yeah, and some had all videos. kinds of Oh, man. <laughs> it's fantastic, man. And, it, I mean, 
what do you think about what what do you think about younger or majority musicians nowadays i mean phil talks about it uh do you think people swing as much as they do or they did back then i mean like it's a different kind of swing it's a different kind of swing see because a lot of it that's why i say it's important to go back and that's why in all my courses that i teach about the evolution of jazz um i start with african music and the early things that happened here, the field hollers and, and all those kind of things, because you hear that spirit, that soul, that movement, that swing, that, that's an important component. Like I say, you can play all your Lydian and Lydiot and the Idiot and all these <laughs> other scales and stuff, but it, it don't mean a thing if it ain't swinging. And you're not telling a story. So when you listen to Dexter Gordon, he tells you a story. And his story is his story. So that becomes his story. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's what it's all about, you know. John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Hank Mobley, Eddie Lockjaw Davis, on and on and on, you know. All these people, it's not trying to copy a lot of people. You know, you have your favorites, of course, like I've mentioned, Paul Chambers and Percy Heath were two of my immediate favorites, you know. But then when I met Milt Hinton, he influenced me a great deal. Oh, yeah. I'm still trying to learn how to do that slap tape. He showed me, I've got a, a <laughs> tape that I did that's in a part of the archives up at the Schomburg, where he, I interviewed him for a Louis Armstrong series that, that was done. Yeah. And he was showing me how to do it. I got to practice it more. But he could do it, man. He, he's a one man band. He'd be. Amazing stuff. Oh, man. I think there are some videos, possibly on YouTube, of him doing that. If you guys are watching this, you might be able to figure oh, out yeah. to find that. <laughs> but, um, well, uh, it's been great talking. You know, I, I have uh, perhaps uh, a couple more questions just to finish up. Um, uh, as a jazz legend today, because you truly are, you've worked with a lot of amazing cats, um, what advice do you have for young musicians on the scene today? Because there's thousands of them, and there's a lot of them that I feel may, are maybe misguided or, or just don't have uh, an elder cat to tell them how it is or set it straight. I mean, back in the day, there used to be like a teacher mentorship thing which doesn't particularly happen nowadays. So what do you have to say to younger musicians? Well, the first thing I say is get your soul and your spirit together and don't, you know, keep your head in check. Don't, don't, don't make your head so big you can't walk through the door. Uh, and one of the things that I see in varying degrees today in, in you know, we're doing this in, 2012, uh, everybody wants quick start. And so there's, people want to resort to gimmicks. And you know, if, if you want to be a true musician and a true uh, contributor, in my opinion, is that you have to be humble, but you have to be confident and you know, learn how to deal with people and understand because you got to perform for people. And I'm not interested in, in, the, in the quick fix and I'm not interested in that American Idol thing, you know, of thinking that I'm going to become a star overnight. And that's why a lot of those people that go through some of that stuff, they, they're like, you know, a flash in the pan. Yeah, they're gone. Because no, there's no, no bottom to what they're doing. They're, they're more interested in stardom than they are learning their craft because it is a craft. And all these things, the spiritual, aesthetic, and all these other the objective statuses of the studying and just knowing people, traveling and relating to people and all this stuff and playing with different people who are serious as well. All of that's important. You know, and, and don't be so absorbed. Everybody wants to be the quick star thing, you know. And, uh, you know, you got 
some of these guys, the rappers and stuff like that, and I admire what a lot of them are doing. But you know, just don't get into that Holly Weird syndrome, you know, where it's, it's about, you know, I'm bad, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, no, just be cool, <laughs> take it easy, and just learn how to be a person and, and, and recognize the roots that have produced the fruits. Great. Well, uh, thanks again for uh, speaking with us. Um, where can people uh, check you out nowadays? Are you uh, still performing? I know you're teaching at Manhattan School of Music sometimes. Yeah, I'm part time. Where, where can people uh, um, check you out? Swing University, I know you're teaching here. Um, are there any upcoming performances? Yes, well, I, I just came back from, uh, I was in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, at, while we're at this moment that we're taping now, uh, at the Jazz Education Network uh, Conference. And I had my band there. Uh, and I also played with an all-star group doing the music of Oliver Nelson from the uh, album Blues in the Abstract. Truth and his son, Oliver Nelson Jr. Excellent. conducted. <laughs> it, was, it was great. We had, we had a good time. Bobby Watson, really fine alto saxophonist. And uh, Terrell Stafford, who was a student at, at Rutgers? Yeah, 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 and, and uh, we had we had a good time. And um, in Dougal Chanclair, he played drums, and Shelley Berg on piano. Uh, the other two gentlemen, I didn't know know them, but they're good good players, good you know. Players, yeah. they, they were, so it, and and I'm I'm working around, and I've have been doing for several years like concerts at the Schomburg. But I'm interested in getting back in, I've, and I hope to be doing some things here at Dizzy's Club Coca-Cola. I spoke to Todd about it, you know. Great, yeah. And uh, I'd like to become a part of the the um, stable. Yeah, you should be. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Having worked with Yeah, you, you know. Work with and I've known Todd yeah. for years. I met him mm -hmm. years ago before he really got involved in the business. Uh, in fact, we were playing a thing in Cincinnati and Todd, we were traveling one of those DC-60s, I'll show you how long ago that was. Coming off the plane, Todd had a movie camera and he was taking pictures of all of us and he sent me a copy. I asked him, because I, I, that tape got buried in a whole bunch of stuff that I have stored away in the warehouse. But he said he was going to uh, try to resurrect it and, and cut me a DVD of it. Look okay, here, we are talking about DVDs. <laughs> yeah. Twenty years oh, ago, I a DVD. What is that? Dude? Yeah. You know, but um, yeah. So I'm going to be around, and, and people should just go to my website, www.larryridley.com, and also uh, www.juneteenthjazz.com, and uh, www.aajc.us and uh, get a feel for that because we're doing a whole bunch of concerts across the country in different cities that have recognized Juneteenth uh, and we, we do a tribute to all the various musicians that were born and raised in those areas. Like we, uh, last year we did uh, 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 John Hicks from St. Louis yeah. and uh, Grant Green. Uh, we do a thing every year, Jay McShann in Kansas City. There's a number they can get all that information from, from that web, from the website. I don't, because um, now there's something like 40, 41 states that have recognized Juneteenth as a national day of observance, and we're working very diligently to make that happen. Well, thank you, Dr. Ridley. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.